Humble greetings in the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Greeting um, every pastor, the 70, the leadership of the church, in Jesus' name. Um, it's good to see you. Amen. I know we all thought we were going to be seeing each other next week, but as the Lord would have it, here we are. Amen. So we are to make the best of it um, according to our ability and really just bask under the light of the salvation that the Lord has provided for us through the platform that he has prepared. I am going to be going through the second portion um, of religiosity versus spirituality, which was a presentation that was introduced last week, um, last month rather, by Pastor Sbia, whereby we were taken in through the introduction of the theme and the topic using various examples just to be able to bring us into the mind and the idea. If you remember correctly, we had Ubaba Umajola who had to make his pick out of three bottles, amen? A dirty one outside, clean inside, a dirty one inside and dirty outside, and the third one was clean inside but dirty. Okay, what was the mind or where were we being channeled? We're being channeled towards understanding what spirituality is, is in the expectation that the Lord has of us versus what religion is and how many people come under the banner of salvation thinking that they're in pursuit of a relationship with the Lord, but in essence are having a religious experience outside of Christ. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at it in a more in-depth analysis, looking at religiosity as a spirit, how or where does it come from, and how does it operate today? We will remember that initially when we were having the presentation by Wusbia rendered, that we had pictures where we would have a very overt satanic movement, where we'd have people that are either in Gothic clothing, Gothic meaning all black, with the nails, with the horns. They were very um, expressive in that they were God haters. Do you remember those images? Then we saw a refined change and look, whereby they were no longer tattooed so much, but they were moving towards a very simplistic and conservative look, such that a priest in the, Satan, in the, in the church of Satan would present himself in a suit, just like our pastors would present themselves in a suit on a Sunday. And we learned there that with the change in time, the satanic devices and strategies also evolve. Why? Because he's the one that masquerades as an angel of light. He is covert, he is subtle, he wants to hide. And so he no longer utilizes outside, outsiders in order to penetrate the church, but he utilizes a, a tactic that was used um, in ancient Greece when what happened, it's one of the greatest love stories ever told between Paris, who was a son of a king, and Helen of Troy. Now these were two superpowers of the time, and these two superpowers at the time um, were threats to each other. We all understand in ancient history that a power or a kingdom was established by colonization. So these two powers, okay, were in, co in conflict such that they knew that if ever one was to go against the other, they'd have a very mean fight which would take a lot of years. So then the kings started to have a relationship where they were pursuing a, 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 a what is it called, a treaty, whereby they would agree that they would have peace in both sides. So after a number of years of deliberation and communication, they eventually came to an agreement whereby Troy eventually said they would get into this agreement. So then the men, Paris, the young boy who was a prince of the king, went over to Troy to hand over the letter from his father's hand to the hand of the king. And the story says that when Paris came in, he met Helen of Troy, who was the queen of Troy. And she was a beautiful woman. It is said that her beauty was the face that launched a thousand ships. What happened? These two became love struck and when they gazed into each other's eyes, everything changed. Such that after the signing of the papers, the queen decided she's going to go back home with these. So she was hidden in the boat and they left. 
And the minute they were off ashore, Paris showed his brother that no, I actually took the queen. And the brother was like, oh wow, everything our father has worked for has just gone down the drain by this one act. Okay. They got ashore and of course, all the way back, Helen of Troy was found missing and the king knew who had taken um, the queen. Then literally all hell broke loose. So one of the greatest wars took place, that is why she's called Helen of Troy, the face that launched a thousand ship. Why? Because this king with his allies all marched against them to go and fight and pursue and kill and conquer. Now it is said that because these men in this city or, or, or king was a very strong kingdom that fought to make sure that they had high walls to fortify themselves and to barricade so that the enemy cannot come in and penetrate. And even though Troy was trying to come in and, 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 come in and, and, and penetrate the city, they would fight relentlessly, but no movement was taking place, such that the king with his allies decided to change his strategy. They decided we cannot come in unless they allow us to come in. So they made as if they were going to retreat and then they offered a peace offering. So what they did is they built a wooden horse, very big, and they placed it outside of the city gate. Then they took their ships and they looked like they were sailing off. What they did is with this wooden horse, they actually placed soldiers inside the horse and they left it out there. And after a number of days whereby they were deliberating whether they should open the gates and take this horse or not, they end up thinking, hey, you know what, maybe this is just a peace offering and these people have left off, we might as well bring it in. So when they opened their gates and took in the horse, they looked at it, did not understand what it was about and left it right there in the city. And the story goes that when night fell and everybody was asleep, the soldiers that were inside the horse started to undo the planks of the horse and came out and they set the entire city ablaze in the night. So that has become a well-known tactic which is known as the Trojan horse whereby the enemy, realizing he cannot fight you from outside, has to be able to come within in order to destroy you from within. Now, the spirit of religion works in the same way because it is a spirit that operates within the church through children of God that by all means love the Lord. They will observe the law of God, they'll put on their duke, they'll put on their long skirts, and they're going to want to abide. But the problem here is that when you take the word of God as a law and you neglect the spirit of the letter, there you find religion. Amen? Amen. So as we are going to be opening, we are going to open with Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, which reads as follows. But when they saw, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. But when he saw, he who, this is John the Baptist, the one that it was written about in the book of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 that he will be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. He was a forerunner of Christ. He was a prophet. He walked in a level and a rank that is high, such that the Lord says, of him there is no one greater than John. So he walked in a high level of discernment. He walked around in camel's hair, ate locusts and, and honey, and he lived in the wilderness. And he would preach and do what? He would baptize all of those who would come for repentance. Now his radius or influence was so great that he did not need to move from his locality, but people would come to him in order that they might be able to gain his repentance. Now, John was very peculiar. In his discernment, he was not apologetic, and he certainly was not tactful. 
he would say it as it is. Now, people from Judea, from Jerusalem, and the entire region would come to him. And on this particular day, you find the same account in Mark, as well as Luke, as well as John, that speaks of what happened. So there he is, John, baptizing people as per usual. And all of a sudden, the first front row come to him. Who are these? These are the Pharisees. These are the Sadducees. You must understand that there are three groupings, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. These were the major religious groups that were the lawgivers, the scribes. These are the men that were the preservers of the law and that had the rights under the Levitical law to do and keep the ordinances of God. They wore particular attire. They had phylacteries. A phylactery is what? A phylactery is a box which had the word of God written in it. And they would put those phylacteries on their foreheads and tie them. Why? Because they wanted people to see that they lived according to the word of God. Now, the issue that these people had is that in as much as they were well versed in the law, in as much as they were judgmental and had the opportunity to decide who died and who lived, these people failed in that the word was always outside of them and never made its way inside of them. So when they were coming, the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to the baptism, It's good news, right? Because it means they've come to a place of recognizing and understanding that they are not in right standing with the Lord. But there's John, calling out unto them, you brood of vipers. Who has warned you that you should flee from the coming wrath? How, John, isn't the purpose of baptism so that people can repent. Why would you insult them? Why would you speak about them in this manner that would discourage them and the onlookers? Now, discernment allows you to read the heart of a man as opposed to the action and the words of a man. When God sent Samuel to go, and anoint David, he says these words, I have found a man that is often mine own heart. Everyone expected a man. All his brothers had the right height. They had the face of kings. They looked like they could fight, and they looked like leaders. But God said to Samuel, none of them are the one. Do not sit down up until he comes. The minute David walks in, he says, arise, anoint him. He is the one. What made David peculiar? His heart. So John, being a prophet, the same prophet that was able to discern when Christ came, when onlookers saw a man walking to the river, he says, behold the lamb. Why? Because his spiritual perception and vision was so sharp and accurate that he was able to see things that men could not physically see and touch. Such that he would speak things that seemed like they were opposite to what people expected. Why? Because he carried the very heart of God because he was a prophet. Remember Amos 3, 7, I'll do nothing except that I let it know to my servants, the prophets. So he carries the heart and therefore he has the ability to discern. He has inside of him a sift, a filter to not look at the outward apparel, the outward words, but to look according to the way in which God looks and judges. And then he speaks these words, brood of vipers. Now, what is a viper? A viper is part of the family of snakes, most dangerous and most poisonous. They grow from anything between 25 centimeters, which is almost the size of a ruler, to about three meters. Now, these snakes have what we call fangs, meaning they are not like spitting cobras where they spit at you, but they need to come physically to you in order to bite you. Now, when they bite you, they release outside of them venom that will kill you in under three minutes dead. And what do they do? When they bite into you, 
they have to flee and go into water in order to what? To take off the toxicity in it and return so that they may be able to watch and wait for their prey to die and for the poison to come out of them before they are able to consume you. So John is saying, you hypocrites, you poisonous snakes, who go and do what? Place burdens that are heavy that even your forefathers and you yourself cannot carry on others. And now that you've taken off your poison on your prey, you are coming into this water to what off? To cool off lest you die. He's saying, I am here because I'm a forerunner of grace and truth which will come through Christ. And you know that now your time is short. And if Christ arrives, your era and your time of rulership is going to end. So you're not here to repent, but you are here to make as if you are part of this so that you can gain an audience. So John is speaking to them so that the onlookers cannot be confused. He's speaking to them so that it can be indeed revealed what it is that they are here for. In John chapter 1, I think 19, we hear the discourse there taking place whereby they start interrogating John as to who are you and why are you here? 19, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Then 24, um, he says, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees and they asked him saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Who is, it is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. These things were done in Bethpara, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So here, John, the gospel, tells us of the intimate conversation that reveals that which John the Baptist was actually complaining about. They were not there of their own will. Why were they there? They were there because they were sent by who? By those in higher authority. They were there to check out the competition, to be able to what? To rightly divide the word because they knew a Messiah was coming. And that's why they're saying, who are you? Are you him? Meaning they were Pharisees. They were the law keepers, but they did not have the discernment to be able what? To recognize the times. Luke 12, 56. It reads as follows. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Hypocrites. Meaning, you have the necessary tools and the ability to discern certain things, but you are not able to discern the things that matter where it counts. Now, Isaiah 40 had said that a voice will precede Christ. John was that voice who was making a way for the Messiah. But because the hypocrites, because the Pharisees, because the Sadducees were, did not carry the letter of the Spirit, they could not discern and therefore they went to interrogate. Which is why he called them vipers. Why? Because they were being cunning. They were being subtle. They were doing that which the enemy does best, which is to make sure that he slithers and slimes his way into a position of power to be able to do what? To propagate his agenda. Presentation, please. Spirituality, what is this? This is the extent to which a born-again believer shows 
or allows the Holy Spirit to lead and control his or her life. Meaning when you get saved, it's not enough to say I've been accepted as a child of God. Why? Because when you enter into salvation, you are entering into a body. You are entering into an institution. And you need to be able to walk the breadth, the height, the depth, and the full volume of salvation according to Christ. When the word of God says he is the gate, it means we only accept salvation when we accept him as Lord and Savior. Matthew 16, 16, who do men say that I am? You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Upon this revelation, upon this confession, you do we understand? So our lives do not stop and end at the door. But upon receiving and accepting Christ, that's when all things begin. So Romans 8, 14 speaks about those that are led by the Spirit. Those, that are, those are the ones that become the sons of God. Not the ones that recite scripture. Not the ones that go to church, not the ones that wear long clothing, but the ones that are led, meaning they take the hand of the comforter, of the guide, of the divine spirit that is personal, that Christ said, I shall leave you with. They are the ones that become then the sons. They are the ones that are spiritual. Christianity and children of God and Christians have started to look at spirituality according to the manifestations of the work of the Holy Spirit and equate that with spirituality. When we look at giftings, when we look at anointing, when we look at calling, we always look to these things in order to confirm that indeed these people are spiritual. And this is not new because Nicodemus, when he goes out to Christ, he says, we can see that you come from God because of what you do. Meaning that it's natural when people look at the output of the product to then think that this equals this. But what does Christ say? He says, no, 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 you must be born again. Why? He was recalibrating his mind. He was regrouping him. He was showing him, no, no, no. the things that matter first are your regeneration, your acceptance of Christ, and your birth anew. Amen. So spirituality then speaks to that. It's got nothing to do with titles. It's got nothing to do with ability. When I was growing, uh, recently saved, um, you would, I would read, 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 and then sometimes the, the Bible just is bare and you, nothing resonates and nothing makes sense and the Old Testament has names you can't pronounce and it's like, oh well, I wasn't there anyway. You want a shortcut, and it's, you move to the New Testament, then you realize, hey, I can't exactly understand everything that's in the New Testament because it's an unveiling of that which was veiled in the Old Testament. Then you think, I, I want a shortcut. So instead of reading, I would put on a video uh, of a sermon, and then think, hey, someone's gone, you know, and I'll just listen to that and get the f a beautifully presented plate at the end and it'd be content. And Holy Spirit would be like, <whistles> you'd be like, I'm watching. <whistles> yes, Lord. What you're doing is receiving the end product. This person had to sit with me in order to give you that. I am here, and yet you are neglecting me in order to get that which comes from me. You go back to the book, and it's tiring to read. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to read. And sometimes the voice of God can just be very annoying because you think you've met the standard. Then he takes it one bar up. And you think you've met the standard and he takes it one bar up. The example Pastor Smear was saying when you do the word, that you're walking in this way, the word will say walk straight. The word forces you to do this. But the word doesn't pick you up 
and put you in course. You have to make that decision. Have you ever had a fight with the Holy Spirit in a shopping mall? Have you ever fought with him? There you are shopping and on a shelf you try to take something and something falls. And he says, pick it up. You get so mad, you think to yourself, and now, because it's intangible. You pick it up, and it's as if it will evolve, because the minute you pick it up and you put it right, it falls again. And then you, and you end up having a conversation with yourself and him, and people look at you like you're crazy as they walk off. But that moment, that voice, that guidance, to the world, it seems like you're dwarf. You get frustrated and you become angry because you realize you are not in control of your own decisions. But I promise you, if you walk away from that voice, that obedience, you end up running a risk of being a Pharisee. We want to listen to Holy Spirit when we are here and he says, pray for Pastor Duma, release this and this and this. No. We think that the working of the Holy Spirit is when I say, Nonkanyezi, the Lord is saying this and this and this about you, and right now I see. No. That is not it. What makes you able to do that? It's the ability to listen. It's the ability to obey even when it says things that are not conducive for you and things that seem as if they are putting you at the receiving end of backlash from people. When your ear and your obedience are married, the outward things are my powers, are my miracles. It's not people that are highly anointed. It's people whose ears are really refined to the leading of the Spirit of God. It's not amazing. It's not spirituality. No. It's obedience. So when we are in this area of training, a simple thing as when someone says something and you want to respond, and he says, hold it. He saves you from a world of turmoil that because you spoke, you become disobedient and you make yourself vulnerable. But if you had refrained because he knows better and he knows best, you sit and you watch and all things will be unraveled in due time. There's nothing that remains hidden in God. There's no lie. There's no secret. There's no plan. There's no strategy from the enemy that can be concealed from him. Man, yes but not him. Why? Because he sleeps not. He slumbers not. He's able to hear secret conversations in closets and spaces where you don't have access. So when you are reliant on him, you have a competitive advantage over every other person. Why? Because of your reservoir on source, which is credible. Your reservoir and your source that only wants what is best for you. Even when it seems as if these things are killing you. Because Holy Spirit will instruct you to do something that you're going to say, no, but I think you are against me. Why? Because he's antagonistic to the flesh. Amen? Now, religiosity is a set of organized practices of a structured belief system shared by and among those who are members, Galatians 3.3. 3. So religion comes from the law of God, the ordinances, because the Pharisees didn't anoint themselves. They took everything, they extrapolated it from the law of Moses. But what did they do? They prioritized the law over the lawgiver. They shunned him. Okay, who Galatians 3 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? This is now the Apostle Paul baffled 
by the Galatians. He's gone, he's preached, they've accepted the Lord as Christ crucified. And yet, over time, doctrines come in that made them want to become dependent on their flesh. And so his opening statement in the first verse is, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Okay. There was a very big fight in our kitchen uh, during the lockdown, whereby we always work, uh, AVM team, Oma Kasela, Uma Dona, Ayanda is there, Babum Tembungala, No Babu Sbi, and it's a battle over Samsung and iPhone. And there they are. No, Samsung is better because of this spec and this. Check up GSM. You're going to be able to get this and this and this because I was a sign there is no competition. <laughs> On the other side, the Apple um, uh, 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 users are saying, no, 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 there is no other except Apple. <laughs> and they're saying that, Oh, Samsung or Guaba votes because it has access from every range, but Apple doesn't compromise. They know who their markets are and they won't go down. <laughs> and this debate is going back and forth, get back and forth. Then Babu Mtim, who had an Apple phone, he, he was the one that wanted to migrate over to Samsung. So he was leaning towards their argument. So I could see him doing some floor crossing, <laughs> moving over to this side. But business, but technical, but I'm casual, but I'm casual. Got my dimensions, the phone, the clarity, my megapixels, and so forth and so forth. And I said, "You foolish Galatian, <laughs> who has bewitched you? <laughs> Having started by grace." Why would you then think that you are going to win by works of the flesh? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so he was in that predicament, Paul, to say, but you've got this. You didn't have to work and labor. It was God, Christ, who came through and bought your salvation. He purchased you the high price. He purchased you with his blood. Why then do you think you need to revert back to the law? Because the law was the shadow of the things to come. And that is what religion is. Having received grace and a free pass to do all things, and all of a sudden thinking, ah, well, don't be calling to lange sabata. I guess he think he sees. But when he came, he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Look at the mind of Christ. Yes, he's God. Yes, he's divine. Yes, he's able to do all things. But strip him of all of that and look at him from a humanistic perspective. He's a leader. He's actually a revolutionist. He breaks the mold, he changes systems, and he restructures mindsets and thinking pattern. He would deliberately do things on the day he was not told to do it. Deliberately. Why? Because he was trying to change the way in which they had formed and built their mindsets so that they could learn not to hold on to the shadow, but to grab hold to the substance. It was his way of gently pursuing them from religion so that they could move to spirituality. Let's look at what he does, um, as a presentation please, at the wedding in Cana. John 2 verse 6. Now they were set, they were set, now they were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Thank you. Now, Jesus is at the wedding with his family and his mother is there. Um, be careful, John only uses seven miracles. Why? He writes last, and he writes with the intention to show that Jesus is the son of God. Doesn't give us his genealogy, but he takes him and he catapults him outside of time and says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So whenever he selects his um, uh, uh, um, stories or the miracles, they are there to be a sign. What is a sign? A sign is a board that gives you direction to where you need to go. 
So he picks seven of these of which he makes sure that it has to do with a discourse or a dialogue where we hear the words of Christ more than what he did. Okay. So when he picks this one, it's at a wedding. It's his first miracle. He's sitting there and thinking everything is normal. <laughs> and then they say to him, his mother says to him, they've run out of wine. What is the mother doing? She's being a mother. She's doing what? Uvali Shazo of the wedding hosts. So she goes to him, why? Because she knows what he's able to do. And says, look, they've run out of wine. And Jesus probably thinks, or he says, woman, like, it's got nothing to do with me. I wasn't part of the planning committee. It's not my wedding, so. And he then, she says to the disciples, do whatever he tells you. She's being a mother. What's getting part of when? Jesus, you may be, but ah, the one that's gonna decide what's gonna happen here. So, Jesus then says, take out <laughs> the jars <laughs> for purification. What? These jars would stand by the door. Anyone who would walk in, they would wash their hands and leave their dirt inside. He's not saying go and take umpongolo so then put wine, which is what anyone would want to do and get. But he says, no, 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 take those stone jars and put water in it. How are you going to say we must make wine? What were they there for? Ceremonial purification. So he's like, you want wine? It's fine. I'll give you a lesson with the wine. They do that. Six of them are there. Is it a coincidence that man was made on the sixth day and there are six jars? Is it a coincidence that six is the number of sin or the number of flesh? They pour it in and when they pour it in, he turns those jars, the jars that you're not meant to drink out of. Why? Because they collect debt. And he says, put wine. What does wine represent? Relationship. What does wine represent? The blood. At that wedding, he decides to turn things around. He does not follow the rules. He says, I'm not going to take what you expect. Why? Because you are so interested in ceremonial cleansing and purification and external appearance. But the real matter and the crux of all things is the things that are inside which you do not pay attention to. So when I take the very thing that you utilize, that you think has power, and that you would actually discard and move it away, and show you that I'm here to change things around. You are going to drink out of the very thing that you despise. Why? Because man is sinful. And according to the book of Romans, the word of God says that we, we fell short of his glory, which means by the grace of God, we should not have anything to do with him. Because we are cut off, we had no hope, we had no God in this world. They also failed to keep it. But he's saying, no, I have the ability to take something and make use of it for something better. He's saying, I want to take you and I want to change that which is within you and change your name so that you can become a vessel of honor as opposed to a vessel of dishonor. Do you think they ever washed those jars? There was no need. They'd probably just put clean water and then after that, leave it. They left it outside of the door. Why? Because it was not utilized for any other thing except for the cleansing before a person comes in. But Christ takes those same jars and makes them the center of the event. He says to them, I'm able to change all things and utilize all things, which means even though we were sinful and we were objects of wrath because of the fact that we come from the loins of Adam, but he's the one that is able to take out that which is within and make it anew so we could move from a place of being outside to being at the very center of all things for his own glory and for his honor. Amen? Let's move. So the Bible refers to us as vessels. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21 to 21, 20 to 21. But in a great house, they are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Mm. The key words there, he will be a vessel of honor, number one. Two, he will be sanctified, just like he sanctified the, 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 the cisterns, the jars. And then after sanctification comes usefulness to the master. To do what? To do every good work. Now, these lessons that he was placing before them was to try to win over even the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees were well-meaning. They were a very well-meaning group. They wanted to keep the law. They wanted to ensure that there's strictness and make this obedience to the law. But the issue is they were exempt from it. Meaning, you could do everything that they preached, but you could not do as they did. Are we together? So now Christ is saying, there is a better way where your name can change so that you become a vessel that will bring honor and be able to do every good work that he has prepared for us to be able to do. Now the question is, where are we meant to do the work? How are we meant to do the work? Amen? Now, a vessel is a bowl and a container that keeps substance, yes? It's important that the part of the vessel is the inside part, because that's the one that carries all things. That part is what comes into contact with the content of the vessel, what it is carrying, understood? Okay, now we are always ensure that we wash our cups and dishes in order to prevent dirt from contaminating the content within. And so is the process of our salvation. We want to eat out of this dish and get, we want to be able to be healthy and not have any contamination in it. So what does God want? He wants the cleaning of the inside more than the outside. We focus on the outside and the Pharisees focus on the outside and they neglect the inside. And that is what religion is. Ensuring that they are praying in the marketplace publicly, ensuring that they keep the tithe, the deal, the mint, according to it. But are they doing it with the intention of pleasing God the Father, or are they doing it in order to be able to tick off the list? We see you are zealous when you come to church every week, and we see that you get here before everybody else. The question is, why are you doing it? We see that you give towards every need in the house of the Lord. But the question is, why are you doing it? Remember the frustration? You learn you have to give, then you give. Then the bar is raised. Why are you giving? What is it that you're looking for? Because I'm trying as best as I can, to do what you've said I must do. And now you're asking me why? I'm doing it because you said I must do it. That's not enough. What is the driving force? What is the propellant? That is the question that the Lord seeks. You preach well, glory to Jesus. Why? Not because the roster says so. Why? Do you do what you do? When we are saved, we understand the order of salvation, the nine steps that speak from election, justification, conversion, all the way to glorification. That is the stuff that happens in between. And get from the time you say yes, Lord, at the gate to the time you are glorified and you'll be able to be taken up back to him. Okay? We're looking at the filling of the sandwich now. 
The benefits of salvation are redemption. And get we are far off, we are purchased, we are bought, and we are redeemed. The most um, uh, simplest example of redemption we find um, in the book of Ruth, whereby Naomi and Ruth are left stranded, both having lost their husbands, being at risk of losing their title deed. And God sends Boaz as the kinsman redeemer. Why? Because in ancient Israel, you could not own a title deed as a woman. So if you were widowed, you had to have someone in the genealogy or the bloodline of your husband in order for his, the estate, to remain in your name. Back in the day, not only are you going to be bereaved having lost your husband, but you're also now going to be at a risk of losing your estate as well. So God then, in his manifold wisdom, allowed the heart of Ruth to cling onto Naomi as provision for Naomi to be able to have restoration. Okay? Be careful now, Naomi. When she enters back into the land coming back from Moab, what does she say? Do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara, because I left full, but I've come back empty. She's cursing herself. When you allow pain to speak over a circumstance, the enemy utilizes the Trojan horse, your own mouth, because out of your own mouth comes life and death. He doesn't do anything. He just pricks you long enough for you to confess and curse yourself. When she spoke those words, she was looking at the fact that both her sons are dead. And she says, to, how am I going to help you? Even if I was to now have a child, there's no way you could wait long enough. Why? Because she was speaking because of her myopic viewpoint, limitation of understanding because she had forgotten the God she had turned away from. God made provision through Boaz. And the night before, they had been gleaning and the night after, they are the owners of the field. Only God can do that. So redemption is that. Being at your worst, being at the end of the rope, being cursed because Adam has sinned, Christ comes, gives us salvation, and what looked like an end becomes a beginning through salvation. Amen? Amen. Second benefit, adoption. We get a new name. We get access to things that we've never, ever been able to have access before. We are called sons of God. Being adopted into this family means this family has certain customs. The certain has certain culture. The, certain, the family has a certain language. There are things in which when a child speaks, it exposes where they are coming from. When a child speaks, uh, and is not able to recognize authority, you are able to see that this person came from a, a family that has not had a nuclear structure where they have a male authority and a female authority and they do not understand the what? The economy of a family and how it is run. So Holy Spirit helps you to move beyond the offense of the child to go back to the propellant, which is the home and the background. And then it changes things your perspective first, then the perspective of the child. Then the child gets adopted and then starts to learn that Ubaba is called Ubaba because he's the head of the house. And Ubaba must have food brought about by a tray. Why? Because it's teaching you headship. Do you understand? By the time the child comes here to the pastor, Agavela Tengen's Leon. Why? Because through the adoption, they change the family values and the way in which they learn. They become accustomed, and that is what is expected of us. When we speak anyhow, and we come into the word of God, the word says, let there not be cross joking amongst you, but speak to each other in spiritual psalms and hymns. Speak things only that will edify the next person. So we have to learn a new tongue here. In the world, when someone hurts you, you hurt them back. But here the word of God says, no, you forgive. 
There's a recalibration of the mind. The system is changed. Everything about this place is strange. Everything about this place makes it seem as if you must be the doormat. Why? Because if you want to speak for yourself, he doesn't have an opportunity to speak for you. But if you will remain silent and be still, then you give him an opportunity to speak on your behalf. Sanctification. This is now the sanctification that comes through the word. Jesus Christ, when he makes his prayer to the Father, um, preparing for his departure, he says, sanctify them with your truth. Your word is the truth. Meaning every portion and part of our lives needs to be sanctified so that it can be according to what the word of God says. 17, 17. Uh, everything that the word of God says and not necessarily what we think. Now, Apostle Paul in Thessalonians 5.23 makes the same prayer. He says, I pray now that your whole soul and your whole body and your whole spirit be sanctified through and through. What does he mean? He says, yes, you might be spiritual beings and you might be able to think that spirituality is about perceiving things that are spiritual, but you need to be balanced as an individual. Okay, that's why he speaks to the tripartite being, okay? The soul, the body, and the spirit, okay? Because we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in the body. We are the exact, uh, similar, we are similar to our God, the Father, who also is a tripartite being. And it's, we've got the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. So we find this triology bringing about balance. Now he says two are better than one, and then people are able to be espoused. <laughs> so the two are better than one because if one falls, the other one will bring him up. But then what does he say? Babusmi, please stand there. Okay, he says, a three-strand cord is not easily broken. This is marriage. It's not this, it's this. The three is what? It's God. Then it's the female spouse and then it's the male spouse. He says a marriage that is united in this manner is unbreakable, why? Because the third strand is what holds all things together, balance. So now, when, we, when Paul says, let us sanctify, he says, let us sanctify every area of our lives. Not just the spirit, giving food to the spirit, but the soul where your mind lies, your volition lies, your decision making lies. Your decisions are not gonna be made according to what you think, but should be made according to what the word of God says accordingly. We all know Amanda Sbisi, who's late. She worked, was comfortable, but she would never make a decision outside of praying over it. Her car would, would uh, have a mechanical breakdown. And then she'd be like, Yo, I need to get a new car. I'm like, yeah, it's about time. This car has just been giving you trouble for too long. And she'd be like, yeah, um, but I just need to pray about it. And in your head, you're thinking, but you've got a pay slip. Um, you can afford it. You've got a need. Why? Because she understood that you cannot do anything out of the counsel of your own mind, but every decision, even if it's a, 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 a financial decision, it may, cannot be made outside of what God has to say concerning that. Are we together? So when, when we are presented with thoughts in our mind by the enemy, arrows, fiery darts, and whatever is going to come into your head, you have to take that thought and present it to what the word says and vet it against the word. And if it's of God, it's going to pass. If it's not of God, it's going to fail. Satan can make us think anything, but it's about how we respond to what he has thrown. According to what is your vetting, according to the word of God. Are we together? That's why when we speak about fighting against vain, vain imaginations and anything that tries to exalt itself above the knowledge of God, we as Christians believe the testimony of the enemy more than we vet what the enemy says according to the word of God. If I stand here and I say something that you've never heard before and you feel like I ain't at or is not biblical, the enemy will say she's speaking from her flesh. And it, 
and you can walk away. Why? Because you've taken that report and you've accepted it. Your mind is not sanctified. But if you will take that and say, she said something I've never heard before, and you say, Lord, what did she mean? Then the Lord will give you a relevant word to explain what that meant so that you'd be able to be healed from that which the enemy wanted you to run off with. We find having to put out fires, which I thought this of you, and it's like, but why didn't you take it to the Lord? Because we have the duty to sanctify ourselves with the word. Even with the body, the body's gonna crave its cravings because it's filled with lust. But you take your body and you take to the word. And the word will say, the spirit is willing, but the whole flesh is weak. So what's happening to you is not new. You're not the only one. But what do you do? You persevere. You hold fast to what the word of God says. That is the expectation that the Lord has of us. That is why the apostle makes the prayer to God. Why? He says that you may become blameless and be preserved up until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all three elements need to be presented unto God for our salvation's sake and for our preservation. Amen? Last one. Second to last, okay. Renewed mind, okay? We're going to go into this one bit by bit. Number four, five. Then we become partakers of the kingdom building. So before we run with the work, we cannot skip the steps. Amen? Now, here we have a graph. Okay, thank you. All right, so, oopsie, sorry. There we have a graph, an X and a Y axis, and we have at the top, good works at the bottom, Bad works, okay? And these are the types of works that we do. Now, you're gonna say, how come it's going downwards? Because it's there to indicate where it will take you. <laughs> Amen? I'm gonna craft your shoulder pants. Now, let me see if you're gonna do this. It's hooking. Okay, now, in the world, this is how we operate. Why? Because our spirits and our minds have not been regenerated, thank you. And we do not know any better. And it, we are sinful. Young in the is 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 corrupt. Ephesians 1 to 3, 2 verses 1 and 3, please. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who was dead in, in trespasses and sins? Us, okay? That is who we are. We were dead in trespass and in sins. Hence, the evil works. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Who is the author? It's Satan, the prince of the power of the air, and it's his spirit that works inside. Remember, we're talking about vessels and we're talking about the content. So the fruit, the evil works, are propelled by the spirit of disobedience who belongs to Satan who drives us. Verse 3, please. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Thank you. So our graph makes sense now. Angit, we are sons of disobedience because of the spirit of the prince of the power of the air who works within us to do what? For us to actualize his agenda. And so, as we're living in the world, we do things. Bad things, and this is time moving. This is how we are moving. Next. Here we receive salvation. Ephesians 2.10. Sorry. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you. Now, comparing this to verse 2 at the top, it said that the works of the son of disobedience were walking the course of the world according to the power of the prince of the air. But here in verse 10, when we get saved, we are still working, but now we are working for someone who is not the evil one, which means works are still required, but they need to be opposite to that which we were doing in the past. Amen? Okay, let's go back to the picture. Yes. So here at the point of salvation... Things need to change. What must happen? Works start out small. In the course of time, they move and they become bigger and bigger. Scoop again. Then we start serving at the end. Is it clear? Okay. Now, this is an ideal growth in salvation. That's what is expected. Next. What is the realistic one, though? We start off here in the world being evil, and we get saved. But what do we do? We carry on, and it. Not all of us have Paul's experience. Paul got saved, turned, he didn't say, I used to kill 99, so now I'm gonna kill 95, because I'm growing. And it's, we like that line, I'm growing in the Lord. It's so funny how we want to reward ourselves for our personal change. We want to learn. You're like, I sang in God. God. I used to. Now, how do you compare yourself with yourself? Because you're not the standard. And yet, if Paul had to compare himself to himself, how long would it have taken him to stop killing people? You have to compare yourself according to what the word of God says. Religion comes with self-righteousness. It comes with pride. Do you understand? It's this flesh. You're relying on your flesh. And it's, you're testing things against your flesh. Pride sits in the lap of a fool. And that for me was justified. You would they have to provoke me and then provoke me to act. But that's not biblical. When I read Proverbs and I learned that anger sits in the lap of fools, I was like, how because the word changes things into the proper perspective. The word does never, never speaks on your behalf. It exposes you to yourself. And if you read it correctly and you understand the intention of God concerning the word, then you are able to change for the better, and you rate yourself against the word. And I'm telling you now, every time you rate yourself according to the word, you'll be found wanting. It always looks like a moving goalpost. But we need to strive day in, day out, up until we attain the goal. Amen? Amen. So this is a more realistic indication of what happens. At the point of salvation, we still try not to be angry, try not to ngapa. We try, we, we're trying, we're learning, okay? Just like an infant, making sounds. After making sounds, it then starts to articulate itself with words, okay? It'll make sounds and points, then it'll start putting itself in words. Then from words, it'll start being able to make a sentence, okay? So from there, we have the process, which is a renewed mind. Then we move to um, growing and serving begins. Let's move. Here is a regretful state of salvation. Here you started out with evil in the world. You get saved right there in the middle, but there are no fruits. 
there's no change, you still have a hard heart, you're still ill-tempered, you're still impatient, and you feel justified. To make you do a bit. Yeah, but when you start speaking like that, when you start to speak like that, you are getting yourself into trouble because you never move from under the negative to here. You will remain right there, and this is where you're going downward. The word of God, when presented, is presented for you to be able to hearken unto the call of the king. Irrespective of the source, irrespective of the mouthpiece, it's there for you. Holy Spirit recently did such an amazing thing. And you sit there and you marvel because you realize this is God. We're at Bible study and Pastor Botelez, yes, she was ministering. And she did a demonstration, and when she made the demonstration, Holy Spirit says to me, everyone in this room is on a ledge. And the word that she delivered is a rope flying and suspended from the air. Those that will grab hold of the word are going to be saved. Those that remain on the plane are going to fall. Meaning those that walk according to the maternals of their mind and the flesh, looking at the vessel or looking at the word and re- failing to receive the word, are going to die. But those that are going to elevate and lift up their eyes unto him, they're going to reach to that rope and they're going to be saved. Then he made me uh, call an altar call based on Acts chapter 2, no, 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 Acts 23, comparing 9 rather, where we compare the response of the, 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 the onlookers on the day of Pentecost to Peter's explanation. And he says, uh, what then shall we do? They cut it to the heart and say, what shall we do? And he says, be saved. And they got saved. But Gala, when Stephan is preaching, they also get cut to the heart, but their response is different. They gnash their teeth and they do what? They close their ears. They charge at him and they want to silence the voice. Why? Because they fail to realize the suspended rope. Come Sunday, or was it Sunday? Papa Stasbia is standing at the front and calls Wendy on a stage and asks for an usher's cloth and says, this is the word, the rope, that the Lord is going to thrust where you are to pull you to himself. There's no bilateral. Do you understand? But he's attesting to himself about what is the responsibility of the word. It's not for you to look at the vessel or to look at the circumstance. It's for you to, to run for that rope. And when you cling onto the rope, no matter how difficult that rope is, that rope sustains you and it draws you to himself. And so whenever we come into access of the word, you must not deliberate with yourself and ask questions and think, I imagine, should I, should I not, and so forth. No, yours is, Lord, you've sent down your word. I am here at this time under the hearing of your voice. Help me by giving me a spirit of obedience to run and cling on to the word. That's all you do. You don't calculate, you don't subtract, you don't deduct. You say, help me. If it's a hard word to accept, it's okay. But pray to accept. Amen? Now, people that fail to accept the word of God, they remain in this regretful state of salvation. These are the people that end up, excuse me, not seeing God. Who are these people? The sons of Eli, priests in the house, They did evil in the house of the Lord, having access to the word, and they died. Who are these people? This is Saul, having an opportunity to be anointed by God, having a prophet to speak the word of the Lord to him through Samuel. What happens? Because he did not heed the word, because he did not want to change his nature, he ended up committing suicide. He ended up pursuing the word of God, even though the vessel had died the regretful state. 
When we allow the word to be around us, in front of us, next to us, besides us, but not inside us. Now, this is the realistic picture, remember? You're going to hear that works of the flesh, which are evil by your old nature, then here you are enlightened, but you're still battling with your flesh, you're learning. And in between this salvation point here, you are starting to change and you're starting to turn. So works of the self, which are the dead works, start to uh, um, show themselves. We ask ourselves, why are we doing the things that we are doing? Okay? Then we move from the works of the, uh, to a place of the works of the Spirit, which are the fruit of the Spirit, which we find in Galatians 5.21. No, go straight. Thank you. Now, look at the realistic one based on Romans 12, 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you. You find here the conformity from the world, which we are charged not to, so we are being told to come out of the world. Then after non-conformity is transformation. And that transformation happens through the renewal of our minds. Why? So that we may be able to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, which is exactly what we've been learning in um, discernment when we're looking at the book of Hebrews. And it's that after exercising, we are able to learn, we see what is good, and what is evil, we are able to test for ourselves. So the Apostle Paul here is saying that the transformation of the rule of your mind helps you in your discernment. Remember John's discernment? But he's able to see right through their hearts. You cannot discern if your mind is not transformed. Are we together? Okay, now, I see abantu abangeko transformed. Their minds are what we call debased. Their counsel is darkened. Okay. It means that they are unchanged. Their inability to be unchanged forces them to look at things with the old eyes even though things are made anew. They may see alongside to someone else who is transformed, but based on the filter that exists, it's going to inform their vision. Okay. Here is a ruler, a 30 centimeter ruler. When you have a 30 centimeter ruler, you know SAPS approved is standardized according to 30 centimeters, 30 centimeter. But take the same ruler and put it into a body of water. What happens? It changes the way it looks. And it, have your eyes changed? What has changed? The substance by which the ruler is submerged in. Now, based on what is filling you inside, you are going to say that ruler is not 30 centimeter. In regards to any and everything. Now the problem is, the one whose vision is obscure is the first one to point out the wrong thing. Not realizing that they think they're correcting the wrong thing, but it's an exposure of the wrong vision. Here is the Lord preaching outside the temple courts. Here are the Pharisees, and it's the law keepers dragging a woman caught committing adultery. No one asks how she was caught. No one asks where was the partner in crime. 
But here they are, dragging her. They thrust him to the feet. And what do they say? This woman has been caught committing adultery. The law says such should be stoned. What do you say? It looks like the whole narrative is about the woman adultery. But what is it about? It's about them testing Jesus. And he, knowing their intention, knowing their hearts, why? Because he was discerning. He doesn't look at the noise. He doesn't look at the stones. He doesn't look at the allegation. He does not look at the woman. But he looks at their hearts. They've called many. They've stopped Jesus from ministering. Because when a person has a religious spirit, they don't care to know what does God need. They care what they want and what they think should happen. So don't mind Jesus. Don't mind the people he's preaching to because we have an edge and case it must be dealt with right now. So you, Lord, stop. We're saying this woman has been caught and Moses says, what do you say? The word of God says he carried on writing. And what did he do? He then... He knelt down, he, started, he began writing, and then he said to them, if any of you is without sin, be the first to throw the stone. So the court case about the woman caught in adultery changes, and the accused is not spoken of anymore, but the accusers are revealed for what they are guilty of without pointing out to their sin. Amen. I got a sugar to wear, no one's a good to wear, no one's a good shy egg. He could have. He's omniscient. But he doesn't. He says, You with your unnamed sin, if you don't have it and I'm wrong, stone her. He exposes them and their wickedness as they are trying to expose the wickedness in somebody else. Lalel, the story wasn't even about the woman. It was them setting a trap for the Lord. So how many people are used and become victims of circumstance for another agenda that is known to those driving it? Why? Because this religious spirit, this pharisaical spirit, is a hypocritical spirit. It dresses itself as we want to keep the law. Let's continue. Transformation. Now, a person whose mind is stuck there Their heart is blind. Their mind is blind. And they are alienated from God. They walk away from God. Being estranged, then they are away from the light of God. When they are not in the light of God, they may have the word of God, but because there is no spirit of the letter, They're not standing on the fountain of light, which is Christ, who then in the fountain of light, you are able to see light. They carry out the word. What do you mean? Satan has knowledge of the word. What does he have access to? Scripture. But he does not possess the word. Because scripture is the law the written, the graphe, the logos. But the living rhema word is the word in which you receive to speak to you in a particular circumstance. And it, hence he was able to say, fall, he will, live, he will send angels. And it, that is the graphe. But Christ says, do not put the Lord God to the test. Why? Because he has the spirit and he has the rhema word for that situation. Are we together? So those that are religious have the word, the scrolls here, the the scripture here, the scroll here, but they don't have what is the current word concerning the circumstance because there's no spirit. 
So they alienate themselves from God, then they are in darkness, and their hearts become blind. Why? Because everything they do is born out of ill motive. It's born out of flesh. It's born out of what they want to see happening. So when we get transformed, the renewal of the mind, the change of the mind, it then comes from the term metamorph, which is to change into another form. Carry on. Now, to transform is also to transfigure, and it means meta, which is to change, and morph into another form. Where do we find this? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Lo, in the beginning, that John 1, 1 is the same in the beginning, that Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The fact that you have in the beginning is the inception and the commencement of time. So John takes Christ outside of the Gospels and he counterpulls him fast forward even before the Old Testament and he puts him just before Genesis 1.1. And he's saying the form of Christ was a form that had never been before because he was in the beginning. In the beginning, Usungenisa is cut. In the beginning, God created heavens, that is a space. And he created the earth, that is matter. The three continuums in which empirical formulae or scientific formation stands. So John says, in the beginning was logos. Logos comes from where? Comes from, or means the driving force behind all things. Biology means bios life. So biology is the study of life. What empowers life? So John doesn't find any other word adequate enough to describe Jesus except to call him Logos. So he says the driving force behind all things, even time itself, even matter itself, even space itself, he was here before these things were. That same Logos, that same word, that same Christ had to change his formation because in 14 he became. That's transformation. He was a spirit. He was outside of time. He could be anywhere, anytime. He was not limited to anything. But in 14, we see him as a seed, the incorruptible seed. The spotless, perfect, succinct, pure seed that came from above, from heaven, from God. This seed did not need to be in the body of a man like Adam and Eve. When Adam knew Eve, he was able to deposit himself in him. No, this seed would come through a special vessel, the Holy Spirit. How, how will this be for I know not a man? Don't worry. For the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. And so, Holy Spirit carries the seed and deposits it into the simple maid servant. The Word, the Logos, the propellant of all things, changes his form to become a seed. He's incubated in the womb of a woman the creator leaning on his creation to be able to nurse him up until the fullness of time. To transform is to change into a state you've never been before. To transform is to change into a state where you cannot reverse back to. We see this in the life of an, a frog. An adult frog will give and lay eggs underwater. The eggs will change to an embryo. From an embryo, Obu Shobi Shobi, a tadpole. We see a head, we see a tail. We see the formation of gills. And then the body becomes longer and bigger. And from there, we move to hind legs. From there, we have the head forming structurally. And then the front legs appear. Then from there, a little frog. Then a young frog. And then an adult frog. The same change happens with a butterfly to metamorph, to be that which you've never been before. 
That is what Christ expects of us when we enter into him. When we enter into the door, we are to be that which we've never been before. That's why we say, it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. No, not so yet. Because we see more of you and less of him. Now, the beautiful thing about Christ is he's an experiential teacher. He does and says, do as I've done. So that we are without excuse. He did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. So when he says, humble yourself, it means you need to be humble like Hannah, who realized that she could not have children, who realized that her husband could not help her. So she decided to go to the Father, to God, at the priest's temple and pray. She prayed so deeply, such that her words could not be understood, that Eli the priest says, Haibo, are you drunk so early in the morning? Why? Because there are certain things when you go through them that you don't make sense to the person standing next to you. There's a depth in God and a pain that drives you to speak a language that others don't understand. Her answer is, no, I'm not drunk, my Lord, but I am pouring out my soul. She's saying, I'm pouring out my mind, I'm pouring out my preconceptions, I'm pouring out my knowledge, I'm, praying, I'm, I'm, I'm pouring out everything that I thought I knew. Why? Because we are a vessel. And you cannot come full. You have to be empty that he may be able to pour into you. If you know, you are useless to him. But if you don't know, then you are pliable. Then you are malleable. Then you are able to do that which he wants because you trust him. She walked away with a baby in her belly because of the space she was in. She realized she didn't need a baby. She needed a new name and she knew she could only get that name through God the Father. If I wanted a baby, I would have made sure that my baby has the best pram in the world. That all my neighbors would see me. We are going to go back to the picture of the Lord Jesus on the ground. The accusers of the woman and the woman. Standing in the midst, in the courts of the king. They were not obedient. They were not discerning. They were not sensitive to what Christ was saying. But instead, they drove their own agenda. The spirit of religion allows you to have access not only to the church, but it also gives you access to Christ. But even when Christ does speak, it's up to you to discern what he's saying. The word of God says, when he asked them if they had no sins to cast their stones, they did not just take the stones and move back out with them. No, they took those stones and they left them inside the temple. Meaning that they left the church or the temple in a state that it was not in before they came. They polluted the temple and they left the work to be in the hands of somebody else. When we do not sensitize ourselves to that which God wants, and we allow the lust of the flesh to have a louder voice in us, we trample underfoot and we bring a halt to the working of God. And not only do we damage and stop the work, but we also desecrate the sanctuary. The defilement of the Lord's house 
is not brought about by diabolic spirits and powers out there, but by the contamination of our own hearts when we refuse to move from the heart of stone to the heart of flesh. Theologians say when Jesus stepped down, he didn't write on sand. Why? Because the temple courts had cobblestones. As he ignored them and carried on writing, scripture does not say what he was writing. Others infer that he was writing the law of grace, undoing the law that was written on the tablets of stone by Moses. Why? Because grace and truth came with Christ. But the sad thing is, after they left the stones, he had to deal with the woman. When they left the stones, somebody had to clean up. When they left the stones, they did not stop setting traps for the Lord. The state of the stones left in the temple courts was the state of their hearts that they left right there at the feet of Jesus. Had they repented, had they hearkened to the words of Christ, they would have seen what he had said, but because they were so consumed by their own selfish ambitions, by their own dead works, that they carried on taking those stones, no longer to stone the woman committing adultery, but to actually hang Christ on the cross. The hypocrisy that they had as they dragged the woman to Christ is the same hypocrisy that made them accuse Christ of blasphemy when in actual fact, they were the blasphemers. The spirit of hypocrisy comes with pride. Pride does what? It blinds you from yourself. Pride elevates you through self-righteousness. Pride does not allow you to be able to give an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to give you an opportunity to change. Pride says, not I, it is them. Pride inflates you and makes you believe you are greater than what you ought to think of yourself. Pride comes from Satan who, after being filled with pride, thought he was greater than the Father. Such that he moved a third of the angels so that they could do what? Usurp the power of God. Now, if you understand power, you understand that power can never be usurped. Power cannot be snatched. It's not a commodity. It's not tradable. But power is surrendered. If kings go head to head against each other, when the one triumphs over the other, it's the king of that kingdom who has to lift up his head and he, out of his own mouth, must say, I, sir, meaning I hand over. But Satan thought he could take power from God and it was no competition such that the word of God says he remained seated and throned but Micaiah went to execute. So what deceived him? Pride. After being judged, he fell. And what happened? Pride told him to dust himself up. Pride told him that he can make himself like the Most High. Pride told him he could make his seat above the throne of God. Pride made him become inflated. So the spirit of religion, the spirit of the Pharisees, the spirit of hypocrisy does not give you an opportunity to look into the mirror, but forces you to look outwardly. This spirit causes you to cross off things that don't resonate with you. This spirit forces you to put Jesus aside and force your own agenda. This spirit makes you and your cause more significant than the law of the house. When the Pharisees 
Pharisees took Christ. They took him to the Sanhedrin and the councils. He moved back and forth into the temples. When they realized that they could not kill him according to their law because they were under Roman ampership, they changed the accusation. And they said, this one says he is king. The minute they said king, they were moving from a religious argument, a religious charge, and they were making it a political argument. When it became political, they wanted um, um, Pontius Pilate to do what? To stand up. When Pontius Pilate refused, he said, if you don't do this, you are no friend of Caesar saying there is someone you report to who is bigger than you and you need to make sure that you keep your allegiance to him. When Pontus says king of the Jews, as they had said, they fight and say, no, he's not. Why? Because when you have pride, you are going to maneuver and break protocols and ranks and positions so as to make sure that your expected end comes accordingly. But what they did not know is that inscription, King of the Jews, was prophetic. They did not know that as they were charging him for blasphemy, as the accusers, they were in the same position as when they stood in the temple accusing that woman. They said he's not the son of God, but yet he was. And Jesus, in his manifold wisdom, Praise for them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. No, um, Lord, I think they are pretty sure. They, they know. See, they've been having secret meetings in your absence. See, they bought Judas. They, they, they've planned this. They're fully aware. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. But how do you mean they do not know when they know? Jesus was saying, they are standing in darkness. There is no light because they're being fed by their flesh. And therefore, every counsel that they have is according to the dictates of the leading of the spirit of the prince of the power of the air. And they are the sons of disobedience, which is why he is praying for them. Forgive them, Father, because if they don't become forgiven, they'll remain in darkness. So, Father, I'm here for them too. I'm dying for them too. I'm praying that you may accept them, that they may be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Because you, you have sent me to die for all, that all may be saved. So we find the Lord praying we find the Lord being able to discern even at the point of personal loss and affliction of pain because there are levels of discernment. John saw them coming but was not touched by them. He discerned correctly. But getting to a point of discerning even if it's to your loss is growth and maturity moving to a place of praying for them whilst they hurt you is a place we've been called to. Where are you standing? Where are you standing? The woman rose up and the Lord said to her, where are your accusers? 
And she says, I don't see them. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Compare the accusers to the accused. She leaves with the word of the Lord that transforms her life and buys her salvation. But they leave going to eternal 